Well, good morning. Celebrate. It's good to be with you this morning, and I am honored to bring God's word to you this morning. I don't take it lightly. We are meeting uh, currently at my church, which is just two years old, um, in the center of Detroit. And two years ago, we launched this thing, this crazy idea that we could actually bring a church together from all ethnicities. How in the world can God bring a middle-aged, geeky white man and begin preaching in the hood? I have no clue. I speak many languages, um, several languages, but the one I have not figured out yet to speak is the hood. And all the guys in my church helped me, continue to interpret for me, but God is up to some amazing things there. That last man you saw there, his name is Curtis. Curtis, uh, um, I uh, engaged with at a, uh, at a center, and he's, a, he was, he's an addict, to be honest with you. And uh, today... Curtis has been at my, the difference between a short-term trip and being with somebody every day is you know their name and you know their story. And it changed my life. You see, before I was there, I was in a suburban church for nearly nine years with a bunch of white people. I had a lot of learning to do because that was my culture. And we would go in and out of places of challenge and under resource. But it's different when they live amongst you and are with you and worship with you. You see, it changed the way our family does holidays. I can no longer not have a holiday with friends that need to be a part of my house because how could I allow them to be by themselves? Curtis today was doing well for about two years and recently he's back um, do, using. And I just called, talked to him the other day and see the weight loss and everything else. It's a messy, messy, messy. You know, one thing I've learned in all these 30 years of following Jesus in ministry is I can't change anybody. All I can do is point them to Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? And I haven't even started preaching, but I didn't plan to say that, so whatever. <laughs> Let me say first before I open scripture, I'm a lover of Jesus and I'm proud of that. Okay? You may not like my preaching. You may think he talks too fast or whatever, but at the end of the day, the, what you will find out is I actually believe this and I love him. Secondly, uh, I think real men are proud to say this. I'm a lover of my wife of 26 years, my best friend and my comrade in fight. We have three adult children, 23, 22, and 20. I am a blessed man and uh, excited to be with you. Having said that, out of respect for God's word, I'm going to ask you to stand if you will. You're welcome, to, if you have a Bible, to turn to the Old Testament to 2 Kings chapter 13. And we have it on the overhead. I'm reading the New Living Translation. Here's the final prophecy of this old man named Elisha. Hear the word of the Lord. When Elisha was in his last illness, King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and the char tears of Israel, he cried. Elisha told him, get a bow and, and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. Then he commanded opened the eastern window, and he opened it. Then he said, shoot. So he sh shot an arrow. Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram, for you will completely conquer the Arminians at Ephek. Then he said, now pick up the other arrow and strike them against the ground. So the king picked up and struck the ground three times. Verse 19, but the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would, have been, you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. And now your victory will only be three times. Then Elisha died and was buried. Let's pray. And I'm asking today, Lord, that the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts, would be pleasing in your sight. As the prophet of old, Samuel prayed, we pray now. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And all God's people said, Amen. you're going to have a seat. Before I forget, let me just say this. On the back over here on the left, there is a table. Uh, we have uh, mosaic shirts, and I sell these. Got the, got the D on there. Um, as a kind of a prayer reminder for people that are connected with us or want to pray for us. And also it helps our church as we continue to um, deal with our financial issues of dealing in the city. So I encourage you. We have purple, green, yellow, I think, and blue. So uh, you're welcome to see which color you want. And thank you in advance for helping us. Well... Today, uh, as I share with you from this story and this narrative, I just, uh, I learn a lot from narratives. And as I look at this story, I have to ask the first question and the most important question, and that is this, why are we still here? You ever ask that question? Why are we still here? 
I mean, with all that we're going on, is anybody going through a tough time today? Anybody? Raise your hand and say, I'm going through a tough time. And when you go through the tough times, sometimes you say, why am I still here? And the, the answer is from Jesus himself. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, he said, in this gospel of the kingdom, it will be preached as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So basically he's saying we finish the mission and then we go home. And that's been a passion of mine from the very beginning. Let's finish the mission and go home. What do you say? Amen. Now, at my church, we are, because uh, I'm in Detroit, Detroit is 87%, 85% black. We are 60% black, 40% white. So we're a little demonstrative. So you can help me feel a little bit at home. It's okay to say amen. amen. It's okay to clap. It's okay. Sometimes I told Keith last, yesterday, I said, when I get really going and get really excited, several people in the church stand up. And when they start doing this, that gets me going. I mean, I'm ready to go then. And then we just have this back and forth. There he goes. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you don't want me to get going yet. <laughs> so Jesus... Jesus tells us the reason why we're still here is that the gospel needs to go out, right? And as we do this, here's what I'm letting you know, is that it's going to take more than just us inviting people to church. Although the worship team was amazing, it's going to be more than having amazing worship. And although Keith is an incredible communicator, it's going to be more than all of that. It's going to be more than you guys just moving to one location and engage a whole new population that needs the gospel of Jesus. What we're going to need in addition to all of those things is that we're going to need God's presence with us. We're going to need him there because if we, he's not there, everything else we do is basically futile. Going to get an amen. amen. You see, when you ch plan a church, I came from a large church to 20 people. And when you go to 20 people, you have nothing. And so all you need is you need God to show up. And every Sunday morning, excluding this morning, uh, I get it into the, this old building that we bought and we remodeled, as the video said. And I pray over every chair about six in the morning. And my prayer is that God would show up. And now we get a lot of people that are not church to, to come into our building. Everybody. Our, our motto at Mosaic is everybody's welcome. And that means everybody. And it is messy, messy, messy. I mean everybody. And so they're not religious. And so uh, God is there. And they don't know the, the terminology that you and I use when we talk about God, especially as Christians. And so they'll use words like this at the end of our service. Man, there's some really cool karma in there. Uh, like you guys, you guys, you guys, I mean, I can feel the love. I mean, they say all these. And we know those of us who've prayed and believe that God would be there, that they're experiencing God. They just don't know what that is if they don't have a relationship with him. Because God is desiring that what all nations, all people come to know him. That's why he's still waiting to come back to take us home with him. I want God and I want more of him. Anybody else? I want more of him in my life. If we're going to do this mission that Jesus told us to do, we need to know that we're going to live in tension. We're going to live in tension because it's going to be tense at times because not everything's going to be neat and tidy. Your pastor stood in front of you and said, we're going to climb another mountain. Climbing a mountain is not easy. There's going to be tension with that. There are going to be people here that will attack. There will be people that won't like this. But you've got to do what God calls you to do regardless in your own lives and as a church. There's going to be tension with whatever, whatever God calls us to. The second thing is, is, as we do what Jesus tells us to do, it's going to get messy because people are messy. Anybody learn that by now, that people are messy? I, 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 here's, here's my life. Just a few weeks ago, I was in New, New Beach, um, California, doing an incredible wedding for a young couple that I've known since they were yay high. And it was a pretty powerful moment, one of the most important moments of their life. It was a beautiful scene there in Newport. And we were about 90 feet above the Pacific Ocean as our backdrop. And, and it was a beautiful sunset. And it was an incredible moment. And as I was in the joy of that moment, of that experience... Two hours prior, I get a call from my church and says, we don't know where Leroy is at. Leroy is a recovering addict, and, and yet he's been doing so well. And I actually left Leroy in my house to watch my dog and my cat while I'm in California. And they said, we don't know whether he's using, whether he's dead on the street. We don't know anything. And so I, I, I love Leroy because Leroy had been to Thanksgiving two times. He'd been to Christmas with us. Leroy uh, was engaged with my kids, etc., etc. And so here I am in the middle of celebrating this incredible moment with this couple. But yet there's this other side of me in my heart in the messiness of incredible pain of worrying about my friend Leroy. Fortunately, he's not passed away. He has relapsed, but we're engaged still to this day. 
And I'm here to tell you that's the way it's going to be for all of us. It's going to be messy and it's not going to be nice and neat. We like to put Jesus in this little box and have it all nice and figured out and we domesticate him. And I'm here to tell you that's simply not going to be possible. Can somebody say amen? amen. We need to realize there's going to be tension and there's going to be uh, messiness. And, and what you really need to know if we're going to do what Jesus needs us to do is that there's going to be sacrifice. We have a football team here today and they already realize if they're going to win the championship, there's got to be sacrifice. It is not going to be handed to you. We know that the gospel is free. We get that. If you grew up in the church, Jesus gives us this thing called salvation because of his death and resurrection. Correct. But then at that point, it cost us something. As Americans, I don't think we get it. I've been ruined, just so you know. I lived overseas for 10 years in the Middle East. I worked with refugees. I've, been, I've seen the poor of the poor. I've been around the block a few times. It's so funny when I'm in the hood, they look at me and they say, you look like a Southern, Cal Southern California dude from the suburbs that really hasn't, suffer hasn't experienced any suffering. I'm like, there you are just stereotyping me, just like we stereotype you. You need to hear one another's stories, amen? amen. And so why we continue to fi figure this out what we need to realize as I was overseas, I remember I was meeting with these believers in this country called Uzbekistan. And for just a, having tea, they said to us as we were having tea with them, last week we were in jail. Uh, the authorities came and they threw us in jail because it's an Islamic nation, but they're Uzbeks who happen to follow Jesus and they threw them in jail. They thought, well, this is God's lot for us, so we're going to minister as we're in jail. So they started cleaning the jail, sharing the love of Jesus and praying for people. The police started asking them, who are you and what you are about? And they explained why they did what they did. And the police were so confused by all this, they just kicked them out of jail. <laughs> it's hilarious. And as I'm having tea with them, they're saying this as though this were everyday weather kind of news. Because sacrifice was the norm for them. I think, church, it's, it's a time that we will understand if we're going to finish the mission of Jesus, it's going to cost us something. Amen? Amen? So just have a few thoughts with you this morning about this uh, king, Jehoash. If you have notes and want to take note, or if you're a note taker, let me give you the first point. The lessons that we can learn from this king was he is engaging with this old prophet Elisha. The first point I would say to you is don't settle for less than God's best. Don't settle for less than God's best. Would you repeat this prayer with me? Say, ask for God's best. Look at somebody and say, ask for God's best. Now, it's always funny when I go to uh, predominantly white churches. I find this theme. White people don't like to look at each other in church. But at my church, African-Americans, they kind of like get into or like looking at one another. So I, I want to push you a little bit. Look at somebody and say, ask for God's best. All right. You did it. You're awesome. That's awesome. We have this story of this king, this King Jehoash, and he's under it. Some of you are feeling like you're under it today. He's got a, two battles right in front of him, two wars. He's got a civil war between him and Judah. He's, he's the king of Israel. And he's got this outside force, Aram, coming after him. And anybody feel like you're in the middle of a battle right now and it's coming from both ends? This is where this king was at. Now, sometimes it feels like it even gets worse. And this is exactly what's happened to his king. The dude that he kind of holds as a, his mentor is kind of his source of encouragement. The old sage, Elisha, he's like, I'm leaving. It's time for me to die. Now that's being pulled out from underneath him. And in that moment, here's Elisha. He's going to tell him his final words so he can do what he needs to do. Now I was going to give you a visual on this because uh, uh, he talked about arrows. And I was, I was traveling here from Detroit in the airport and <laughs> I uh, had three arrows in, in my little thing here. And, uh, and as I was going up there to the thing in my carry-on, I was like, hey, can I put this, uh, uh, take, take this on? They were like, no. I was like, look, it's rubber. It doesn't hurt anybody. She's like, no, you can't put it on. So I was like, she goes, you can recheck it. And I was like, are you serious? Recheck it? I said, I spent two hours going through the security line. So I was really depressed, like, oh, I can't give them a visual. I said, here, you can have the arrows. Kind of mad, you know? So I put my bag on, and I walked through the security, and as I was picking my bag up, I looked, and here came the arrow underneath the x-ray machine. I looked around. It's my arrow. I put the arrow on the back and walked to the plane. I lost two, but I got one out of the whole thing. <laughs> had nothing to do with anything. But anyways, I had three. But here's the story, right? He's underneath it all. And the old sage Elisha says, open up the window. By faith, I want you to symbolically shoot the arrow through the window. That's going to give you victory. Take that leap of faith. Secondly, 
the remaining arrows, I want you to go and I want you to strike the ground. What does that have to do with tea in China? I have no idea. Strike the ground over and over again. Sure enough, he hears what the prophet says, strikes the ground not once, not twice, but three times. And to his surprise, after he finishes this, the prophet says, wait a minute. He's mad at him. Why did you only strike three times? If you would have struck five or six or maybe eight times, you would have had complete victory. But you settled for only the minimum. You just did what was required of you. And now you're not going to experience God's best. Hmm. I wonder if that's applicable for you and I. How often in our lives we settle for the minimum. Just when everybody is watching. Just enough to get by. And as a result, we don't experience God's best. Maybe that happens in churches. And I'm here to tell you this morning that we need to understand that God is saying that we need to keep on striking. And Elisha was mad. Now, why do we do the minimum? We do the minimum because we listen to the lies in our lives. Anybody have lies from years past that you can continue to play in your head? Yeah, I think most of us, if we were honest, would say, I hear the lies. I remember when I was a young lad in school and I can still hear the teacher saying, Veach, you're worthless, you'll never amount to anything. I still remember them telling me that. I remember them pulling me out of class because I stuttered and couldn't pronounce W's and R's. And now here I am, a public speaker of all things, God is a crazy God, I'm telling you, right? Now, what is your lie? Settling for way less. I am convinced, folks, that we live way down here and God has so much more for us in your lives, but also for the church. He's given you a leader named Keith who's like, we're not just gonna do church. And if you just wanna do church, they're everywhere. We wanna finish the mission. We want it to do what God wants to do. We want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So it's going to take a group of us, not only in our own lives, but to start hitting the ground over and over again. And when we all start doing it, however big this church is, and you all doing it, can you imagine the pounding on the ground when you have these thousands of people pounding the ground over and over again, symbolically speaking, for God's best for us. I'm here to tell you today that's what he wants from us. So I say to you, why? Why are we not willing to do this? We need to begin to dream and believe God for the best. I lived overseas with refugees for 10 years. We adopted a child from there. I live in the hood, and both of those similarities are that the vast majority of the people live in what I call survival mentality. And when you're in a survival mentality, it's, you can never dream. It's never about what will be. It's about what is immediate and, and having something to eat. And in those moments, not being able to dream is a scary thing. So which group of people do you fall into today? The vast majority of people are the people who never dream about their life. You know who they are. They go from crisis to crisis to crisis. Uh, and they, they allow life to dictate to them what their life will be. They're miserable people. But unfortunately, our society, the vast majority of people just exist. I don't want to be in that group. Anybody else? There's a second group. And those are the people I went to college with. Those are the people that are dreaming. And they're doing the minimum, they're hitting the ground, but yet they never go after the dreams because they get married and they have bills and they settle into the American culture. The third group is the group that dreams and they believe that God is calling them to something that is impossible, but he needs to do it. And they go after it. It's kind of like the two spies that went into the land and said, we can surely take this. I'm asking you this morning to be people that are willing to dream a dream and allow God to do what he needs to do. What we're trying to do at Mosaic is raise up people that actually believe that God wants to do in their lives what he can't do for himself. Cecil, I've worked with for two years. He's only known the streets, but for the first time, he's starting to believe that God has a purpose for him, his life. Amenzi has Nigerian background, and she's now working in a Christian organization for the very first time. And she, she has so many self-esteem issues. We continue to be patient. It's not where Amenzi's at. It's where Amenzi will be as we believe in her life, Right? I prayed God's best for us that he would allow me this past year in 2017 to lead at least one individual a week to Jesus. This past year, I was able to see that 44 times. But in my disappointment of that, God's still bringing people to us like craziness. I'm in the middle of the city and politics is the norm in the city. Uh, and about sexuality and the sexual issue. And we have people from all races and all um, politics and all sorts of things. We don't elevate one thing over the other. We're just followers of Jesus that holds to his word. Does this make sense? And I've watched 
uh, many folks from transgender, homosexuals, you name it, and they're all saying yes to Jesus. And I'm realizing we just don't elevate one thing over the other. We just keep pointing them to Jesus. He's the one that builds this church. Does this make sense? And so as we do all of this, we actually, uh, in our first year, believe in God's best, we sent our first family to Dearborn. If you know Michigan, Dearborn is the largest Islamic population in North America. And they are now loving our Muslim brothers and sisters, teaching them English, helping them with immigration, coming alongside them. Where I'm at, I went to the mosque just two blocks from our church and started doing a meal with everybody. And they said to me, you're the first church to ever engage us because everyone's afraid of us. I said, well, I lived among Muslim brothers and sisters for 10 years. I'm not afraid of you. Right? Where would Jesus be? Right where Jesus would be, where, where everybody needs him. Amen? I ask you today with this first point, are you going to settle for less than God's best? Because God wants to do more than you could ever imagine. Point number two, that is simply this. Don't hold on to the last arrow. Don't hold on to the last arrow. Would you repeat after me? Say, give it all. Say it again. Give it all. Now, this old Elisha dude, he was a kind of give it all kind of guy. He didn't hold back. In his younger days, when he was about the age of the king, he had a mentor, and his name was Elijah. And Elijah was going to go up in a chariot to heaven. And as he was leaving this younger Elisha, what did he say? I want a double portion of you, right? I want it all and then some. I want everything that God wants for me. I'm not going to hold on to anything. So now he's mad at this king, Joash, because he's only accepting the minimal and he's always holding on to everything, holding on to the last arrow. Uh, as far as I understand, although this is a toy arrow, arrows are not for decoration. Arrows are for battle. And why would you hold on to something that's to give you victory? Which kind of person are you today? Are you the kind of person that only strikes the ground three times? Or are you the kind of person that keeps on striking until there is nothing left? How badly do you want the victory in your life and for your church? I'm here to tell you the only way you will ever see the victory that God has planned for your life and for Celebrate is that a group of men and women stand up and say, here is the last arrow. It is yours. It is yours. At the end of your life, what will be said of you? At the end of your life, eh, what will be said of you? Will you give it all or will you make all the excuses? Why not? I'm not the most talented guy in the world. I, as it relates to sports, I was what they called a wannabe. I tried football, wrestling. I broke about every bone imaginable. And finally, about the third or fourth time, I was like, I got to quit this thing, right? But the one thing that everybody would say to about me is that he gave it all, regardless. This thing's called a quiver. And at the end of your life, is the quiver going to have a lot of arrows in it that you've held out? Or is it going to be empty because you gave it all? I'm here to tell you to experience everything God wants Make this sure this thing is empty. Here's what I know, spiritually speaking, is that I empty this thing every single day, loving people in God and Jesus' name. But as I meet with him every morning, he fills it back up, and then yet, supernaturally, there's another arrow there for me to do some more battle. Continues to provide when I need it. Does this make sense to anybody? Don't hold on to the last arrow. And if I give everything that I have, how did Jesus kind of summarize it? He said it this way. Pick up your cross. And follow me. What does that mean? Die. I've been in church a long time. And as a result, I thought, okay, there's a point in my life where I decide to follow him and I die to myself. Now, this many years later, what I realize is, is, it, is that, yes, I die and I decide not my will, but your will. But then as I get older, I have to keep on dying. This makes sense? It's not a one time. I got to keep on dying. So here I am in the country called Azerbaijan, speaking another language, helping people who were in the middle of a war. And while being there, I experienced about everything imaginable that you could experience. A coup attempt, running my car in the opposite direction, while the army is this way, and the protesters are coming this way, and I'm in between both of them. And driving my car out, and putting our team on lockdown. Having missionaries uh, actually being kidnapped, having Americans killed, I lived there during 9-11. I have no clue what it's like in America during 9-11. I wasn't here. And the mayor of the city called me from Baku and said, we'll hide you if you need to be hidden because Americans were being killed during that season simply because they were American. I was a well-known figure in the country because we were building schools for refugee children. I was in relationship with the United States ambassador. And while we were there, he told me and warned me. He said, you need to alter your routes so that you know, somebody may be following you that you're not kidnapped or assassinated. 
After going through all of this, my wife told me after the fact, she didn't know for six months that when I left the house, whether or not I would actually ever return. You see, for most of, us, most of us as Americans, we read this thing called Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus warned about arrests and people being taken into captive by authorities. And he says, don't worry about it. I'll give you what you need and I'll give you the words that you need in that moment. But as Americans, that doesn't, we only read it in the context of that. But I'm here to tell you today, there are brothers and sisters that are willing to give it all because of the culture in which they live in. I went through all of that. And then I went into the tour duty mindset. Well, I, I'm done. Now I've done my sacrifice, right? And he said, no, you're not. And we went and we pastored for 10 years at another church. And then I started thinking about Detroit. And I'm like, man, tour duty, been there, done that. I'm in the stage where I can give money, coach, cheer on, right? I'm 50 years old when I started this thing. And here through all of this, God says to me, no, 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 I want you to start all over. I want you to sell your house in the suburbs. I want you to live in the hood. On that video, those homeless um, houses banded up, that's my backyard, I, I, the way I look at Jesus, if you're going to reach people, you have to live among the people you're going to reach. Amen. It's kind of impossible just to drive in and never engage and understand what they're experiencing. This makes sense. And yet, now that we're in this season, I have to continue to die because my wife, who is a hospice nurse, actually goes from house to house serving the dying in the hood because they can't get nurses to go because of the, all of this risk. She goes to gangbangers' homes, and three individuals will come out. One will stay at the car, the other will escort her and stay at the porch, and the other one will take her to the dying. She will love them and cry with them. She leads so many people to Jesus. You'll never find it on the news. It'll never make a church headline. But I'm telling you in the eyes of God, she is where Jesus would be, where no one else would go. Does this make sense? Last summer, I was uh, speaking in the state of Washington. She, she dropped me off, and I called her. It's a three-hour time change from Michigan. And, and I, I called her up late, and I said, so how are you? She says, I'm at Walmart. I said, why are you at Walmart? She says, I'm buying a baseball bat. I said, why are you buying a baseball bat? She said, well, after I dropped you off the airport, somebody was trying to break into the house, and the dog scared them off. I'm afraid they're going to come back, so I bought a baseball bat. I said, and you didn't call me? Nope. What were you going to do? You're in Washington. I said, you didn't... <laughs> I said, you didn't call the police? She said, what are the police going to do? So she has her bat. She didn't actually couldn't buy a bat, so she tells Rufus from our church. So Rufus says, um, golf clubs work really well, so he hands her a golf club. And then he's literally driving while I'm gone those three days. He's driving up and down our street, and he thinks he's t leaving a voice message with my wife, but he's actually got my number, and he's saying, and I'm picking up the phone. He's like, Miss Melanie, I've been driving back and forth tonight. I just want you to know there's no bad people out there. You're good to go. I'm just like, the world in which I live in. My church just about three weeks ago, I'm at my desk, and this cop comes in through the door, and I'm thinking, oh, this police wants to talk to me. So I walk out, hey, what's happened? I, know, I notice he's not even looking at me. I didn't realize somebody that they were chasing was already in the building. <laughs> and I walk out of my office, and here's the cop, and here's the individual, and here the three of us are. And I like to talk a lot. It was one moment I was speechless. And as I'm standing there, my administrator and my youth pastor open up the door and I said, shut the door. Because all I knew to know whether he's going to tase him, tackle him, shoot him, I didn't know what. And I didn't know whether he had a gun. So I just stood there silently. And finally the cop talked him out of, the, out of my church and then they, they got him. And everybody went on with their every day. That's ordinary everyday stuff in the hood, right? I have to keep on dying and give my last arrow even if it means sacrifice. Does this make sense to anybody? My story is not your story. He's not calling you to Detroit, to the hood. He's calling you here. What is it supposed to be for you? And what does it look like for you? Does this make sense? Understand that today clearly. He's calling you and me to give of our time, our talent, and yes, even our resource. Let me tell you the last thing in closing. That is, not just God's best and not just holding on to the last arrow, but the last thing I would say to you is look to what will be not what is. Look to what will be. Would you repeat this prayer? Say, Lord, help me see as you see. And we see in this story, what does he do? Shoot the arrow through the window. And after he shot the arrow and he struck the ground, guess what was happening? The battle of war was still going on. It didn't resolve it. It was by faith, knowing that what he did, God was going to do, and God was going to bring victory, bring victory to them because he was going to hang there and do what God wants him to do. Oh, don't look at your challenges. Look at your victories. Don't look at what is. Look what will be. 
You know, I have so many, God convicts me over and over, I have so many people that I over and over again um, that are in, in, in overwhelming situations. And even in my own life, the challenge of the finances of our church, the challenge of people's lives in my church, the challenge of leadership in my church is over and over again. And what I've chosen to do is that we will look towards what is and what is not. We've already got 12 people in our church called into ministry in two years. And we are now signed up with Kingswood University and they're all taking classes with me so we can send them out. I said to the people in Detroit, we're not about creating a, a name for ourselves. We're about finishing the mission, whatever that looks like, right? We put our first elders board together. We are Mosaic, you ready? Five women, five men, four African-Americans, four whites, one from India and one from Egypt. I don't know about you, but I'd call that Mosaic. Is that not the nations? If I go to churches that are homogeneous and they're one ethnicity and I ask them this question, if, in, if you believe Revelation 7 it says that every tribe and every language and every people group will be there, regardless of the church, if they're Bible believing, they'd say, hallelujah, yes. At Mosaic in Detroit, we have the audacity and Celebrate believes the same thing, that because of the cross, we can actually have that relationship today, regardless of politics or the culture in which we live. Can I get an amen? Amen. People say to me all the time, how do you navigate through such a volatile season? I don't set a white man up there and a black man up there and we start talking about reconciliation. I'm okay with it. But that's just to show we actually live it. Does that make sense? Amen. And, and what's so amazing, people ask me, we've grown, to two, we've grown 200 people, 100 a year in the last two years in a city, in an area of Detroit where 44 churches tried to plant churches and they're all dead. And they said, so what's your, everybody, Americans want to know, what's your plan? What's your strategy? I'm like, you're not going to like it. You ready? We love God and we authentically love people. We love people and we love them more than just a handshake and a, and a hug. We get involved with the messiness of their lives and we help them. We can't fix them, but we help them. We don't look at where they are. We look at where they will be. Life has changed, friends. Embrace it. Prepare for it. Engage it. You have 19 years of celebration. Many of you probably weren't here the whole 19 years. But I'm here to tell you, that if God hadn't spoken to Keith that you're supposed to go to this next chapter, you would already begin your death sentence. You celebrate the past, but don't get trapped there. You look ahead today. You want to know when your relationship with God is up to, up to date? What's your most recent story? Amen. Are you talking about things a year or two, three years ago? Or are you talking about something this past week? Amen. May God help us to do this. And at Mosaic, we are committed to look ahead to what will be. Life's changed, addiction conquered, victory assured. We're out, we're about running a marathon, not a sprint. And I'm reminded of Queen Esther, for such a time as this, God has called us to be in partnership together. You know what I love as I conclude? Is that a church like Celebrate in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I would say to you that many people in Detroit never even heard of Sioux Falls. <laughs> Not because Sioux Falls isn't known, because the D is all their, their entire life, right? And you have our church as diverse and as different than yours, that we can still be in partnership. And God can do something because we're all about that, part of that same thing of finishing the mission. So my, so my question is, are you holding on to the last arrow? Are you striking the ground? Are you expecting God to do great things? My prayer is that you would see that for your life today. And I'll conclude with the way I started. Jesus said, how do we know when we finish the race? You ready? And this gospel will be preached with or without you to all nations. And then the end will come. I want to be a part of that. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? I'd like to pray for you. Would you bow your heads? Lord God, if I have said something that's not of you, I pray those words would go away. But if I have said something of you, I pray you would not allow us to get away from it and that you truly would speak because your servants have listening. Bless this church. Beth, bless Keith and his family as they lead. Continue to provide miracle upon miracle as they strive to be the church you've called them to be. We love you and we give you this day. We pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said.